Hi, and welcome to Take Every Thought Captive, our weekly look at the Catholic intellectual tradition and an exploration of the author's books and topics that have shaped Catholic thinking for 2,000 years. My name is Jason Gale. Today, Dr. Smith and I will be continuing our discussion on C.S. Lewis's classic work, The Great Divorce. And so the, this, is a, this will be the third in the series, and the, the first one we talked uh, primarily about just kind of setting the stage about where um, uh, what the story is, um, that uh, the narrator is taking a bus uh, from the gray town, which is hell or purgatory for some, uh, and they're going to the edge of heaven. They're taking a little field trip to the edge mm-hmm. of heaven. Mm-hmm. And the, the narrator, when they get to heaven, the narrator encounters many different things. Uh, and the main thrust of the book is that there are these two ways, the way of life and the way of death. And uh, they are completely opposed to each other. There is no uh, um, no interaction. There is no um, sympathy between the two, that they are completely and um, directly opposed uh, to each other. Uh, and so that was the first the first one we discussed that to kind of set the stage of the book. And the second one, we started to talk about the um, the characters. Uh, mm-hmm. The ghosts uh, that um, the narrator encountered and the narrator had George McDonald as his guide and was explaining mm-hmm. things to him. And uh, so last time we talked primarily about two, the uh, the artist and the domineering wife. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, we're going to pick up uh, on that same kind of uh, theme of looking at some of the characters encountered uh, mm-hmm. by the narrator and by George McDonald uh, as they, 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 they take their tour of heaven mm-hmm. and they're they're going through and they encounter all sorts of people and uh their interactions with uh the different ghosts and discussions mm-hmm. and just right. c.s lewis's uh just um beautiful way of, of uh shining some light and kind of giving us a good allegory mm-hmm. uh for it but like dr smith pointed out that this is not uh c.s lewis does not mean for this to be some kind of tree a theological treatise on um on uh, uh, eschatology or anything like that, but uh, simply kind of doing a thought experiment, an exercise mm-hmm. of the mind, mm-hmm. uh, to, which Dr. Smith and I would thought especially would be a good time to uh, pick up this book during Advent, uh, uh, or if you're listening to this later during Lent as well, uh, um, to kind of bring that um, focus in on um, eternity. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an important question to consider, sure, right, to, right, say right, right. Mild, to say the most mild. Um, so, Dr. Smith, um, let's continue our, our look at uh, some of the people encountered um, by mm-hmm. the narrator sure. uh, um, uh, in this book. Yeah, so the, the th- we'll see if we can cover three characters today and, and kind of wrap up with these three because they're so sort of emblematic. Uh, but before we do that, just one point I want to pick up on from George MacDonald in that last uh um, episode that we did the yeah. uh, one of the things that George McDonald points out to uh, our narrator is that the um, um, the problem with all of the ghosts right who adopt and insist really on staying in the way of hell is uh, self-love right that is pride right. um, that at the end of the day you know the artist that we looked at last time he cares more about his own skill his own his own personality and then his own reputation more than beauty right, right. And the implication there is if he had kind of stuck with just loving beauty more than himself that maybe he could have found his way into the way of heaven right yeah um similarly with the the domineering wife you know at the end of the day she cared more about her reputation her you know the praise that she received for mm-hmm. her house for her clothes uh for all those sorts of things uh, more than she cared about her husband and yeah. that if she cared a little more about her husband, a little less about the house, <laughs> you know, uh, or the kinds of friends, having the right kinds of friends, that kind of thing, then yeah. she would have, um, could have made it uh, into the way of heaven. So today we're going to look though at three characters who have somewhat similar kind of self-centeredness. Um, mm-hmm. both, uh, we look at the disappointed mother, uh, we're going to get the pathetic husband, and then finally we'll look at the lustful young man, right? Mm-hmm. So um, uh, starting with the disappointed mother, I mean, this is one of the ones I think Lewis picked this out on purpose to be somewhat challenging, right? Because yeah. uh, especially, you know, um, uh, you know, rightly formed people, <laughs> right, of course, <laughs> have a high degree of affection, natural affection, respect yeah. uh, for their mothers. 
and uh, and so Lewis, by picking out a mother, right, uh, as uh, a ghost, as an illustration of the way of hell, is, is kind of treading on delicate, you know, <laughs> um, territory here. Um, it starts off, uh, if I remember correctly, her name is Pam. Yeah. Uh, and it starts off with her running into, I think it's her brother, um, mm-hmm. uh, in heaven, and she's not terribly pleased, right? <laughs> so, yeah, Reginald. She's, yeah, it's, oh, it's just you, Reginald, right? <laughs> so Reginald's come down. And Reginald's a saint, right? He's come yeah. down to, to see his sister Pam. Pam's not excited. Uh, who did Pam want to see? Pam wanted to see her son Michael. Yeah, her beloved yeah. son Michael, right? Um, and so, it, you know, of course, in a way, right? You think, oh, look, I mean, what's wrong with that, right? Yeah. You know, sons love their mothers. Mothers, you know, should love their sons. Uh, that sort of thing, um, but the uh, the problem comes to the fore pretty quickly here. You can ask, her, does Pam care at all about seeing God? No, she doesn't. <laughs> she's she's there for she's there for her uh, for her son. Period. That's right. That's yeah. right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's pretty clear about this. Um, and in fact, later during the discussions, you know, she's like. <sighs> You know, I don't care about uh, a God who would separate a mother from um, her son, right? Yeah, yeah, as, yeah. Notice, now this, again, this is a little delicate, right? But as if separating parents from children is the worst possible thing, um, <laughs> right? It's not, right? I yeah. mean, contrary to to what sometimes, you know, gets thrown out there, um, of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a serious thing. It's... Um, yeah. It'd be a tragic thing, but it's not the worst thing, right? There are worse things uh, than than that kind of separation. And think about the kind of separation that's happened here. Is Michael is in heaven, right, mm-hmm. and uh, enjoying heaven, and uh, his mother uh, is in hell. And I think the pretty clear implication there is because she would have Michael before God, right? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. The ghost. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The ghost even says to him. Uh, you're treating God as a means to Michael. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you mean, yeah. You, yeah, you mean the saint, right? Uh, yeah, the saint brother. says yeah, that. Yeah, to, yeah Reginald yeah. says that to, yeah. to her. You're treating God as only as a means, like mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And her, and I love her response. Uh, you wouldn't talk like that if you were a mother, you know. <laughs> and we and we hear that we hear sure. that excuse mm-hmm. of like you have to have this particular experience in order to speak about mm-hmm. uh, uh, something correctly. Uh, and, you know, a, a, I, I really don't like that argument because I don't expect, you know, my cancer doctor to have a uh, to have cancer in order to, to treat me. I don't have right. cancer just to, you know, uh, uh, in case my family. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, this but but this but but I think, yeah, Lewis does a great job of really exhibiting uh, mm-hmm. um, the, the 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 expression of the, the strong love that a mother does have. Uh, for her children, yeah. um, but at the same time, at what cost, you know? Yeah, so yeah, um, um, uh, I think it's Michael says to Pam, he says, oh, well, you, what you mean is if I were only a mother, right? And this yeah. is the key thing, right, is that as much as these natural affections, these natural kinds of relationships, and they are natural, are part of the created order, um, those natural relationships can be corrupted like any other natural inclination or instinct uh, can be corrupted or misguided. Uh, so even the natural affection between, right, uh, of, of a mother for her son, right, mm-hmm. yeah. can actually become uh, corrupted. Uh, so much so that that she, here's the thing is, by natural affection, right, she loves Michael more than she loves God, right? Mm-hmm. And um, this comes out when she starts complaining about the fact that Michael was taken away from her. So you get, we're not given the details, but we get that, that Michael was taken away at a relatively young age, Mm -hmm. Um, maybe teenager. I don't know. What what, did you get an impression for that, Jason? Yeah. Yeah. That he was, that he was very young. Yeah. 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 That it it wasn't. Yeah. mm -hmm. And so, and so she spends the rest of her life grieving, right. Kind of uh, about this, ignoring her husband, uh, ignoring her living daughter um, because of this loss of the son. Um, and um, yeah, you can kind of, there's a fixation there, and she 
she gets mad at Michael and says, look, you know, uh, how could God do this and take my son from me, right? Of yeah. course, who, you know, I mean, any parent's going to sympathize with that, right? I'm yeah. a father. I, I would sympathize with that view and that reaction. Um, bereavement's not e easy, especially for a parent with respect to a child. Yeah, yeah. Um, but at the same time, um, uh, what comes out in that is that she... Um, she prefer, you know, she would say, I, I would rather have Michael than that kind of God, right? Um, which I think is a, is, a, is really a key point there, right? Um, yeah, I don't know, do you have anything, what do you think? Yeah, and, you have, yeah, and yeah. one of the, one of the fix, one of her points of fixation throughout her life that, um, uh, uh, that she talks about was that she, she just says the past was all I had. Mm -hmm. um, and she just kind of, she lives her entire life um, just completely fixated on this singular event um, that has that has come and gone, um, mm -hmm. and and decides to make that the defining characteristic of of her entire outlook on on life. Which mm -hmm. you know, as as tragic and as you know traumatic as an event like that may be, I mean, and as Christians, we're called to uh, you know make make one thing you know, kind of the determining factor of right, our lives. Right, and that right. is, you know, the person of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It's not, um, and, and as, and again, as, as traumatic or in, and as tragic as something, some event like that may be, it mm -hmm. is, um, it is going to be, uh, a, a very difficult thing, uh, for you, for, for, a, for a person, uh, to accomplish. Uh, right. and, and like you said, her, her love for Michael really, uh, corrupts, her uh -huh. love for her husband, her love for her her daughter, um, uh, and her and most importantly, you know, um, her love for God. You know, right, right. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. It's so much so that that my, that that Michael explains to her that's why my uh, 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 that's why that's why uh, Reginald explains to her that's why Michael had to be taken away. Right, yeah. is that the hope that because of her excessive attachment to him, right, mm -hmm. to her son. That, that God taking him away would actually give her a painful freedom, right? Yeah. Um, uh, to borrow a title from another book, A, a Severe Mercy. Um, oh, that's a great that, book, yeah. That would, would sort of cut that excessive attachment, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and get the woman to fall back on God, right? Yeah. Now, now, this is a hard thing, right? And, you you know, as, as he says, you know, uh, as George McDonald says to the narrator at some point, like, you know, you gotta be careful, like how you, like when you say this, right. But sometimes the tragedies in our lives, right. Are an opportunity for us to fall back on God. Right. Uh, yeah. Sometimes the disappointments in our lives, God takes things away from us. Right. Sometimes. Right. Um, because we need to fall back on him more. Right. Um, that sort yeah. of thing. And that, that seems to be the indication of what Reginald's telling us. Right. That's why the reason was, you were too fixed on him, right? There, uh, there should be one ultimate concern, one ultimate end for the human person, as you were saying earlier, uh, Jason, and that's God, right? God yeah. comes before our natural affections. Yeah, and I think that this is an interesting kind of thought exercise going through this story because I think you know even as a as a as a faithful Catholic, like I try to imagine, you know, will I? I try to imagine happiness in heaven like without one of my children and I can't, it's, Ooh. it's, it's yeah. Like how, how can I be happy if one of my children is not there, mm -hmm. you know? So I kind of, and you know, but at the same, but at the same time, you know, I mean, that's that, I mean, that, that hits you hard, you know, but at the same time, you know, I, I don't get fixated on that. I do get fixated on getting my kids to heaven, uh, um, mm -hmm. but not because they'll make me happy, but because, you know, they in turn will be happy. But and, and, and this is why, you know, it's it's important to and this is, I think, where where faith can can really take uh, a, a different uh, a kind of a next mm -hmm. step kind of a, <laughs> a position right. is to say mm -hmm. that, you know, in the end, you know, that that kind of um, in the end, I'm going to be fulfilled. Right. You know, and that's a that's a very weird and odd thing to think about, but at the same time, it, it says it says more. 
about God's love. Mm -hmm. um, but it also says some. I would say it also says something about my weak understanding. Sure. Of, well, of it seems all to, yeah. Eternity. I mean, it seems to me a rigorous application of the doctrine that God is the ultimate. God alone is the ultimate yeah. end, right? Um, so over many monasteries, right? You know, the gates to many monasteries, you'll find the the Latin phrase uh, Deus solus, God alone, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the the point is God alone is actually enough. God and nothing else, right, yeah. uh, is actually uh, enough for us. That's, you know, that, that's, that, that's difficult, <laughs> right? As C.S. Lewis says in other places, you know, that um, God has scattered many... Um, you know, blessings upon our road, uh, many ends, pleasant ends upon our road, but he won't let us mistake any of them for our homeland, right? Yeah, our true yeah. homeland is is God himself, right? Um, and if we get there alone, right, um, that's okay. We still have, like, we shall not have any lack um, mm -hmm. in God, right? Uh, now that's a tough thing. I've and I've I've known some theologians who push back against that. Some of the new natural law theorists uh, push back against that idea that God alone is sufficient, uh, which I think is is very interesting in its own right. But it's maybe for another <laughs> another podcast. <laughs> but um, you know, we tend to sort of emphasize you know our rel meeting our relatives in heaven, our friends in heaven, our family in heaven, and God willing, that is a blessing of uh, eternal beatitude. Um, but at the same time, we need to keep our 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 focus and which is to recognize that just God actually yeah. uh, is sufficient. And um, to kind of wrap up about, you know, the, the disappointed mother, you know, there's nothing like seeing a disappointed mother, right? I mean, that, that, that even, even for a curmudgeon like myself, right. It makes, you know, kind of uh, 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 elicit some sympathy, but, <clears throat> but the thing is this, um, uh, Lewis is trying to bring out that no human relationship, no natural affection, right? Those are the keys, right? No human relationship and no natural affection, no natural feeling is as important as God, right? Right. Um, even, right, the natural affection of a mother uh, for um, uh, a son. And, you, you know, by the time you get to it, you might say, man, that's really harsh. But how you get to the end of the discussion with her it becomes pretty obvious that at this point she just wants Michael and that yeah. she would rather have Michael in hell, right? Yeah. Than be apart from Michael and Michael be in heaven. And you think about that, what a corruption, right? Right. Yeah. What, what, what's happened there is that relationship has become all about what? Her. Selfishness. Yeah. yeah about, right? about her. Yeah. Yeah. The way Michael makes her feel right. Yeah. And again, you know, um, I mean, one of the best aspects, you know, easier maybe to speak about it from a romantic love point of view, but, you know, one of the best aspects of being in love is the, you know, the love you receive from the other person, right? Uh, yeah. that, that's great. It's exciting, right? But that can't become the end-all, be-all, right, of your relationship with that person, because if it does, then it's really just about yourself. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that's what you see in this disappointed mother. Yeah, and I think a uh, final point to make here with me, with uh, Pam is uh, okay. she she's got this great line towards the end, with, and it's it should sound familiar uh, to to all of us in our contemporary day. Um, the ghost it's it's right at the the end of the conversation, and uh, the ghost is talking to her uh, about how she really she actually doesn't have any love. And mm -hmm. she says, I, I, you know, I hate you. I hate your religion. I hate mm -hmm. your God. She's like, yeah. I believe in a God of love, <laughs> uh, and, you know, and, and we, and we hear that all the time that, that, that I believe in a God of love. Um, but, but what many times would people that will use that, I think that will use that phrase, they may say, I believe in a God of love, but what they, what they don't believe in is that they should love God and what he actually said and did for us. Right. Sure. Um, and I and and that's I think that's somewhat what the ghost is trying to point yeah, out. Okay, yeah. you believe in a God of love, mm -hmm. but at the same time, do you love God? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Like, yeah. There's a difference here, you know. Yeah, um, and in Pam, and in Pam's case, and in the case of most people who say that, right, it's a God who will give me what I want. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. That's what yeah. a God of love means, right? Is you know, I want this divorce, I want this adultery, I want this sodomy, 
yeah. that's that's what it means to you know to believe in a god of love, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's not and it's not even a I don't even think it's a real god because none of them will no. proclaim no. any love for that god. They will just say that they will hold up this love as if it's mm-hmm. uh, God is ultimate and God is love, therefore ultimate love kind of a good mm-hmm. philosophy kind of you know but they won't actually apply any love towards god um so, and right. they would just say it's oh it's just you know we need to pr- practice this kind of radical acceptance of everything and that is love you know, it's, just, uh, it's just shallow and vapid and moving right. on, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> That's right. so our next uh character i want to look at here is um we're gonna skip kind of a little bit of the order uh that lewis has here um just so we can kind of end on a on a hopeful note, um, but the next one that's closely related, right? So if you think about the, um, the, the, the misguided artist and the domineering wife, which we talked about yeah. last time, right? They tended to be focused really on reputation and losing, right? The true object of what they were doing. The true object of a wife is to love her husband, is to think about the good of her husband, not her personal reputation, getting the right friends, her praise, that sort of thing. Similarly with the artist, right? The real, the proper object of the artist, right? Is to, is beauty, right? Is to, to love the beauty of things, of objects, right? Yeah. The artist turns that back on himself. The disappointed mother corrupts really a human relationship, right? It's what she's done is she's taken a natural affection and a human relationship that should go out, right? Uh, towards the sun and then ultimately out towards um, uh, God and turned it all back on herself, right? And we find something similar in the pathetic husband. So they have some kind of similarities here. Uh, now, pathetic here, I mean, you could, we could use the word pathetic just as a, um, you know, someone is so pathetic, right? Like just as yeah. a sort of derogatory phrase. And we might want to use that of Frank. Um, but uh, to begin with, really, by calling him pathetic, I really mean something um, more technical. That is it, it, pathos, right? That is, he is... Um, all about eliciting certain feelings mm-hmm. in others, in particular in his wife, right? Yeah. Uh, does that make sense, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's about pathos in that sense, right? So one of the feelings of pathos, right, in a sort of Greek tragedy and so forth is the feeling of pity, right? And uh, if you're a... Uh, if you're an artist, right, if you're a writer, right, one of the things you learn how to do is develop characters who elicit certain emotions from the audience, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, what we have here is a tragedian, right? So this is an actor. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Right, who is always portraying the tragic, right? Yeah. And the tragic is meant to, I mean, of course, Different theorists will say different things, but the tragic, right? When you think about the Greek tragedies, one of the things the tragic is meant to do is draw pity, right, from mm-hmm. us, right? Elicit pity from us. So the tragic, though, like, only occurs when you have, like, great suffering, right? So it's it has to be a kind of suffering of the noble, of the good, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right? If it's just, you know, like when, when evil characters suffer, we never feel any pity, really. I mean, like, unless, <laughs> you mean, you know, I'm talking about like if you're watching a movie or something or reading a book, you know, you're sort of like, eh, whatever, like, you know. Or you feel you joy. Know. You feel Yeah, joy. that's right. Yeah, you're like, get that guy, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, with tragedy, right, you have the noble, right, that has been destroyed or corrupted, right? So that kind of sets the stage here, I think, a little bit for what's going on here. So at the beginning of this scene, we have uh, the narrator asked George MacDonald, like, wow, is, that, is there another river in heaven? And that's because there's this procession of saints mm-hmm. gathered around this one sort of magnificent saint. And she comes down uh, sort of this uh, valley, right? And it's so full of light, right? He thinks, man, this is like a, almost like a river of light. And at first he even, I think the suggestion is kind of mistakes her for the Blessed Virgin, right? Yeah, um, it's called her the lady, yeah. Yeah, right. And George McDonald says, no, 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 it's not her. It, it It's Sarah Smith, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> which is great, right? Because it's sort of like, that's not a very exciting yeah. sounding name. It's about as <laughs> um, uh, being at Smith myself, uh, uh, I can say that. Um, but the, um, uh, uh, but she was a great saint in this life. Right. And mm. wasn't known for anything uh, in particular. Uh, so but she, she was a great saint and blessed many people just through her ordinary life. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and she was a very giving. I think this is the key. She was a very giving and generous woman, right? Mm -hmm. And made all other, made those around her better, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, by her generosity, right, and sort of helped children be better children to their like kind of became a mother to everyone, but didn't replace everyone's mother or, or to yeah. all children. I think she said yeah, yeah. is the way that puts it. Um, and and similarly, you know. Um, Husbands uh, would love her, but not in a way that de de detracted from their love of their wives, rather made them want to be better husbands, right? So it's kind of complicated, but I guess the kind of saint, right, who inspires yeah. saintliness in others, right? Yeah, and, completely uh, selfless. It's that's right. Really, right. yeah, it's juxtaposition between all the other characters you encounter. Right, yeah, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Now, here's an interesting thing. But what's the potential weakness for such a godly woman? Uh, praise and, and honor and glory. Yeah, yeah. You know? I think Sarah might just throw that off, though. My, yeah. my thing, my, I think that her, 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 the chink in her armor, because remember at the beginning when she meets Frank, so she meets this pathetic guy who looks like this kind of weird, like clownish almost ghost, <laughs> and then who has a little dwarf attached to him, and there's a chain, right? Yeah. The dwarf has a chain around this big, gigantic ghost, right? And, you know, it's kind of this macabre, weird-looking scene, and then there's this beautiful woman, and she's like, oh, my dear, you know, whatever, you know. She's greeting her, her husband, who's been in hell. Think about this, right? Um, someone who's very generous like that um, could be manipulated by the suffering of others, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's exactly what you get here, right? Because at, at that first meeting, she asked forgiveness of him, right? Yeah. And I think actually what she's, her, she probably shouldn't have been quite so nice to her husband. <laughs> right. That is, he, she needed to call him to be more manly and less soft, less a feat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, because um, really somebody who's like her, right. Who's so giving and generous, right. He used her natural generosity, right to feed his too great self-pity right yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so what does he say when he first meets her uh uh he says you know she asks forgiveness that's the first thing she does right when she meets this former husband yeah uh and uh and he says oh, like, oh, well, we, all we all make mistakes yeah yeah mistakes, we all right? yeah yeah <laughs> let's say no more of it right yeah and, it's like really <laughs> and then but then so um he says, you know, I've been thinking about you all this time, right? Just how you're getting along alone, tearing out your heart for me while I'm in hell, right? Of course, she's in heaven. Yeah. And she's like, oh, don't worry about that. <laughs> right? <laughs> and he's like, what? What, what, like, what do you mean? Don't, uh, I mean, because she says, like, I I'm, I'm fine. I'm good, right? Yeah, uh, it's over. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, oh, well, I mean, of course, you, you, and it's so, the little dwarf pulls the chain on the tragedy, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> like he's a little puppet. Oh, now I've got to put on my hurt persona, right? Yeah. So if you've ever been around somebody like this or ever done it yourself, right? There's a kind of persona, right? You're, I'm I'm now hurt, and so he 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 pulls on the chain a little bit. It's like, uh, oh well, I mean, you did miss me a little, didn't you? Yeah, didn't you miss <laughs> me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And she's like, oh, don't worry about that right now. Let's go. <laughs> and, and, then he, and then the tragedian and him, the, so the real man, who's the dwarf, yeah. right? So we love the guys, the real man, the real Frank, and then his this self-pitying persona, right, that he puts up the hurt persona, right? Yeah. Um, they say to each other, you notice how she didn't really answer the question. <laughs> I mean, you know, how sad, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but this kind of brings out, right, that what's going on here is this is a man who has learned to play on the pity of others who, and George McDonald talks about this uh, when he's talking to the narrator, right? Um, he's pathetic in the sense I described earlier. He, he needs, he wants the pity of others so that he can get his way. So it's yeah. not even just as bad. It's not even just as it's not even just bad enough that it's this too great self pity because what George McDonald brings out is too great self pity is tied into too great self will, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
he learned early, like in manipulating his sisters and things like that, that he could get his way if he could get them to pity him. Yeah. Yeah. And even he's, you know, he says to her like, oh, so you've been happy without me? Mm-hmm. Like, well, <laughs> uh, uh, like he, 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 he loses his play. Like he kind of loses mm-hmm. uh, uh, where he was getting that, that attention uh, mm. uh and, and all of that and uh, uh, like you said because again because he's so selfish that's um, right it comes back to selfishness at the end of the day yeah yeah he 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 doesn't he loses you know kind of uh his focus in life because that was his focus in life was mm. was getting this the 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 pity and all of that mm. uh um uh, from from him yeah 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 from where yes yeah, so, um he's um obviously deeply misguided in that way right um the and um this is obviously there are times when people really are victims and Mm -hmm. are do suffer and do elicit our right pity but as george mcdonald says in this pity is meant for healing right um yeah it's meant to, to to excite in us the desire to help right uh, to bring a resolution. It's not meant as a cover for evil and it's not meant for, as a cover for selfishness and it's not meant as a tool of manipulation. And that's what he's turned it into, right? Is that, um, this pity that he draws from others and that he wants to draw from, uh, his former wife, right. Mm-hmm. Um, is, um, misplaced. That's not the object of pity. Right. Pity right. is meant, to, is meant to, to take us beyond that. Right. Not to just to make people feel, feel sorry for us so that we become a center of their attention or be, so that we get what we want. Right. Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. that's the thing. Again, this goes back to the idea that the merely natural yeah. suffering. Right. And pity are not the most important things, ultimately. Yeah. And I think you can add to that just uh um whatever the feeling may be i mean mm-hmm. whether it's pity or or something or, or something else that we should we should never place these feelings mm-hmm. um as ends in of themselves so that we acquire right. them by right. by any yeah. means necessary you know i like to feel this way therefore i'm going to do everything i can mm-hmm. to always feel this way yeah you know whether because then you get into all sorts of you know addiction and you get into uh, sure. all sorts of other things and you know so to place that that kind of uh, uh feeling there is kind of you know my end in life is to 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 feel this to feel this pleasure from mm-hmm. receiving pity from other people you know right yeah again yeah. it's again it's it's so self-focused that again it is, it's yeah. it completely mm-hmm. and 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 again it's it's a it's a corruption of of the the, That's right. the good natural things i mean we're not talking about you know somebody choosing evil and you know like that, like, you know, p- no, like you said, like pity is there, uh, for healing and pity can be good. Sure. Uh, uh and so far, but, but, you but, know, but very importantly, yeah, it can ahead. also be, it can also be bad. Right. Yeah. And that's what he wants to say. And that's what <laughs> people, modern people don't, I mean, our version of pity today is compassion, but you want to be compassionate. Right. Yeah. And you have to say it in a really serious way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as if compassion and pity just makes all moral objectivity, uh, irrelevant. Right. And it doesn't. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, if you in, if you in, engage in a path that over time ruins your life, right? Um, let's say that you're a, I don't know, a middle-aged guy and you d- decide to go down a road that destroys your career, destroys your marriage, and you know it, and you're doing it anyways, right? And then you you know you look up you know ten years later and you're like, darn, right? like I blew everything up. Like in a way, like I, I know someone like that. In a way, there's you know I have some pity for the person. It doesn't sure. change the wrongness of what that person did, yeah. right? It doesn't make it okay, right? Um, that's still foolish and lustful and and uh, unwise and all those sorts. Does that make sense, right? Um, yeah. And so, um, you know, it, it sometimes we act as if pity and compassion should should exonerate, right? Yeah. Um, uh, or, those or, who do do evil or or make make evil not evil right no no evil still evil right vice is still vice you know yeah or or remove any sort of uh 
uh, you know, effects or consequences of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Like mm -hmm. we, well, you need to be compassionate about that. But sometimes what they mean is that you just need to ignore that entire part of their life. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, it's like, no, like you can't because uh, those, those actions had consequences and those consequences, you know, need to be, need to be addressed, need to be Mm -hmm. healed. Uh, um, they need to be uh, uh, looked at and examined so that something better can come of it. They don't just mm-hmm. need to be um, ignored or downplayed or, mm-hmm. you know, or oh, everybody makes mistakes, you know, right, or sure. even like, you know, something like that. that sure. it, it, it has to, it has to actually bring about something that is good, something that is. Sure. Uh, I mean, what we're uh, looking for better. is, yeah, is what we're looking for is some accountability and repentance, right? That, that, like, that's, you know, where, um, uh, the mercy side of it comes in, right? Um, and whereas it's very easy, right, to go in the other direction, right, to just play the victim, right? So I think, yeah. you know, what he's, what Lewis is pushing on, right, is is one, the way in which we sometimes play the victim in order to get what we want, right? Yeah. Which is actually selfishness, right? Um, yeah, yeah. But also just that pity and suffering are not the most important things, that pity isn't always the right response, or mm-hmm. that even when it is the right response, it's not the only response, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can pity the man who's ruined his life and still say, you know, friend, um, you need to, to recognize that that these were the choices you made that yeah. ruined your life, right? Um, and maybe 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 we can we can pick up and reform from here, and maybe we can pat, you know, but 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 what needs to be there is not just pity. Right. But in addition to pity, a call to uh, repentance and accountability. Yeah. Which which involves genuine suffering, not this kind of false. (laughs) Oh, you know, like like the the husband is exhibiting here, not kind of this Mm -hmm. false suffering to to exhibit feelings of actual, you know, joy for Mm -hmm. other people Mm -hmm. feeling sorry for them. But real, (laughs) real and genuine suffering, which, you know, which, which, Mm -hmm. again, I think Lewis goes back to throughout all of these is, Mm -hmm. is, is, you know, through the cross, you know, it's a, Mm -hmm. it's a real suffering. Uh, It's a completely selfless suffering that Mm -hmm. goes beyond our, uh, uh, our understanding Mm -hmm. and our, uh, our passions, our emotions and all these things. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, by the end of the scene, right, what happens of course is that unfortunately is that the pathetic husband, right vanishes right into non-existence yeah. because um his former wife won't pity him right uh and won't say that she's unhappy in heaven without him yeah. right i mean that's the key right um is that he wants her to say without you heaven is not happy Right. Yeah. Which goes back to it's kind of the same thing as with the disappointed mother, right? Is, yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, I, I won't have I won't have God without this relationship, and I'd rather have this relationship than have God, right? Uh, and similarly, right, uh, what the husband here is demanding is something very similar, right? That is, um, that you would you would rather her be miserable with God, right, than happy without you. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is is not, I would say, the, <laughs> the attitude of a of a manly and well ordered husband, right, <laughs> towards right. his wife. Right. Um, what we want, right, is to lay down our lives uh, for our wives so that they'll be blessed. Right. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, he's uh, he, this poor guy is just, in, you know. It, he really is worthy of pity, but not just pity, right? <laughs> it's, you know, he's he's he. What he wants is fundamentally disordered. He wants mm-hmm. her to value their relationship over God, and in the end, she does not, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he vanishes, and even our narrator is like, "Isn't that a bit harsh? I mean, shouldn't she kind of have pitied him?" And at the end, George McDonald says, "Look, I mean, and I love what she says." She says to the ghost at some point, um, even the kind of puppet ghost, the the tragedy, and yeah, yeah. she says, says, "I am in love, capital letter love, right, yeah. right." That is, I am in God, and I will not step out, right. I yeah. will not let you bring hell within myself. And and at the end of the day, right, the saints in heaven are not 
their joy and beatitude is not destroyed, right, by the reality of hell. Right. Yeah. And you can see this also with the the um, the mother we just talked about um, when she gets there. Michael is not there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and she's like, where's Michael? Isn't he up here? And Reginald's like, yeah, but he's further on up. <laughs> she's like, why doesn't he come why doesn't he come down you know so i mean it's it, but it but it's it's a thing you know if he loved me why isn't he here you know all these you know all these uh you know this kind of manipulation of, of things like that like to to understand and, and i think it, lewis really points to just the the depth of what communion with god in heaven mm -hmm. uh will be i mean it, it, it is and he points he <laughs> you know uh yeah, just that that our that our understanding of this, um, we can understand some about it, but we can't understand, uh, can't really get to the depths uh, of of what exactly and how strong this this kind of love is. Sure, right. That it's not dependent upon any sort of feelings we have here on earth. Right. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's that's a hard thing to grasp for, <laughs> for us today. I mean, that is. Yeah, yeah, sure, so hard. Sure. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to our uh, uh, to the uh, the man with the lizard. That's right, the man with the lizard. So this is our, the the uh, the lustful man, and um, this is actually you know um, uh, one of the ones that turns out well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and interestingly, you know, Lewis has most of these encounters with the saints um, in poorly, right? Uh, most of them are either left undecided or they in poorly. This is one of the few ones where we actually see the person as the ghost go through a transformation, go through what we could call conversion, mm -hmm. um, and be initiated into genuinely the way of heaven, right? And yeah. you see a total transformation in this ghost, um, from, uh, wh from what he looks like at the beginning, uh, to his condition afterwards, right? And I love that, right? Because it really goes to, right, the the depth of the conversion, right, mm -hmm. that's required, as as well as the depth of the divide between the way of heaven and the way of hell. It requires a complete transposition, right, of perspective, of heart, of inclination and affection. Um, and uh, that in this particular encounter involves the sort of dramatic intervention of an angel. Um, yeah. So one of the things I think is really fascinating here is that this is an encounter not between a ghost and a saint uh, or one of the human you know, say, uh, say, uh, saints, but a ghost and an angel, right? Uh, we actually yeah, get yeah, yeah, yeah. angelic being enters the scene here, um, who's rather scary, <laughs> actually. <laughs> uh, with all due respect to uh, the... Uh, painters of the Renaissance and um, <laughs> I always sort of wish that they would have not painted angels because they did such a shoddy job with it. <laughs> their paintings the are, reality. Yeah. you know, they're beautifully rendered, but they're all kind of like these little chubby babies with wings. Where the heck they get that? I don't know. Anyways, no. uh, yeah. That's not the biblical uh, image of angels, man, at all. Um, in fact, you know, most of the time when people encounter an angel in the Bible, right, they like, fall on their face in fear. Right? Yeah, or you have like, like get Michael. up, get up, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah or they're leading battles, you know, against right. Satan yeah. and his armies. Right. They're not, you know, little chubby, like little chubby precious moments figurines <laughs> on your grandmother's shelf, you know? It's so far yeah. from the truth. <laughs> well, anyway, so, um, but, so what we have here uh, is, uh, um, this guy is getting ready to walk off. So the way this ghost is presented, is he's presented kind of like a young man, uh, a little bit, you know, um, kind of nondescript, really. I mean, yeah, nothing yeah, yeah. Particularly, particularly stands out about him, except that he has this lizard on his shoulder, <laughs> right? And uh, that keeps whispering in his ear, and he's having this conversation with it, and he keeps telling it to shut up, right? And he says, uh, okay, well, if you're not going to shut up, then we're going to have to leave. And then you hear this voice <laughs> kind of come in, kind of... Uh, leaving so soon, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And the young man stops and says, oh, yes, you know, the, this little fellow, I told him if he was going to come, he'd have to behave, and he promised to behave, uh, but he's not behaving, and it's just so embarrassing. I just, I, I, I want to leave, you know. So his his uh, whole attitude is a little bit different. Like, he's leaving because he feels ashamed. Yeah. Which is interesting, right? Um, there's one other ghost that's a little bit like that, 
but that other ghost, we didn't talk about this one, but it was a uh, female ghost. Uh, she was ashamed because of the way she looked and the feelings of embarrassment mm -hmm. she had. This seems a little bit more like, oh gosh, I, I know I don't belong here. Right. This, is what, this is how I feel when I go into a restaurant with my children. I'm like, uh, yeah, we have to leave. They just they keep making noise. Uh, they just won't shut up. So. Jason, at some point uh, in your life, I'm going to remind you that you compare your children <laughs> to a lizard. But, <laughs> but, the, but, but, but what happens to the lizard at the end? That's what I'm hoping for. That's what you're hoping for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he says, like, you know, uh, I just can't get this thing to shut up, so we're going to have to leave. And the angel, you know, or the, yeah, the, the angel says what, you know? Would you like me to make him quiet? It's like, <laughs> right. you know, like it's, you know, almost, you know, it, it almost seems like in a tempting way, in a, in a good way, of yeah, course, because right, it's coming right, from right. an angel. But he's like, would you like me to? And he's like, oh yes, that would be great. He's like, yeah. then I, then I'll kill him. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It was like, whoa, 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 we didn't say anything about killing, right? Yeah, and of course, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, Jason. I want to go back and make sure I'm not. I don't have I can't look at all the text right now, but um, yeah. that this that this lizard represents lust, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, he, and you know, if anybody's ever, I mean, uh, you know, probably all, most men and and others as well have at some point or in some ways uh, struggled with lust, right? Yeah. You know, uh, disordered sexual passion, um, and um, you know, he, it, you know, uh, this image of it being a lizard, right, whispering, right, in your ear, and then. Like there's that kind of constant drum of it, right? And yeah. and that's one of the problems with the the vice of lust, right? Especially, right, is that it's it's not silent. It won't shut up. It keeps coming back, right? It might kind of so when the angel starts talking, it gets real quiet at first, right? Like it's cool. yeah, like like shh, okay, I'm cool. <laughs> don't make, don't let him kill me. Right? Yeah, and he says, "Look, look, he's asleep. He, he's, he's asleep. Won't, he won't that's right. bother. He's asleep." Right? But see, he's just, here's the thing: is he's not dead. He's just yeah. asleep. Right. And that's the thing about a, the vice of lust, right? Is it comes back and it can haunt your mind, haunt your imagination, haunt your feelings. Um, and in that way, I mean, it's, it's a very serious, uh, um, a very serious problem, constantly kind of wearing you down, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, distracting you, that sort of thing. And then when it finally does wake up, I'm sorry, did you want to say something, Jason? Yeah, I was going to say for, for, for our listeners, I mean, you can really apply, you know, that one sin that you constantly bring to father, that's your yeah. lizard. That's you know, that, lizard. that, that, that right. one thing that you struggle with, that's your blasted lizard. Yeah. Um, that, that, that is just, it's constantly there. You, you may think it, it it's gone, but it's just asleep, it's you know, right. and then, it, you know, and then it comes back. So I mean, like in this depiction, it's lust, but I think for, for all of us, we, we have, we all have, you know, at least one, you know, thing that we constantly struggle with and this and is old, that lizard. yeah and the old spiritual writing was called the dominant defect the dominant <laughs> yeah that's right, right. um but we, uh modern humans don't have any defects so we don't we, uh, do <laughs> so judgment yeah so, so judgment, judgment. Yeah, <laughs> um so the um uh now at a certain point then again if you've ever struggled with a vice uh this is i think a very realistic depiction even though it's imaginary yeah. um when the vice, when 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 he's like, I'm gonna kill it, and his hand is getting closer, right? So the angels just says, just let me squeeze it, right? Again, angels are terrible, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, in a good way, they but they should elicit a certain reaction of terror, right? And, and he's drawing in on him, and the young man's like, ah, I don't know, I don't know, right? Because the lizard wakes up and is like, it's going to kill you. Right. Yeah, if I yeah, die, yeah. you're gonna die, and then holds out all these things like, oh, you know, I'll be better now. I won't torture you. I'll only give you soft and and uh, nice imaginations and fantasies, right? And that all that sort of thing. It's just so gross, right, and sickening, right? And um, because uh, it's pleading for its life. I think one of the things that is it's trying to convince that young man that he'll he can't. I mean, this is so irrational. But if you've yeah. ever struggled with a vice like, in a serious way, um, there is this irrational belief that you'll die. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That you can't survive. That's a better way of putting it. That you can't survive 
without that vice, right? Yeah. Um, and that's just a lie from the devil. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. Yeah, I have to get a little backwoods on you here, but <laughs> it just is a lie from the devil, right? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Fact, you know, the killing of that vice is exactly what will make it possible for you to live, right? Uh, and for you to flourish, right? And this is exactly what we see in the case of the young man, right? When that angel closes its hand around um, that vice and it kills it, right? You know, and the young man, you know, like he's, ah, oh, you know, he's in suffering too. So he didn't say it would be painless. <laughs> right? Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he tells said, that. It won't, it won't kill you. <laughs> it won't kill you. Yeah. I didn't um, say it was going to be painless. I said it right, was going to yeah, kill you. Yeah. And so yeah. then what happens, Jason, with the, the rest of it? Yeah, so our, our before before we get into the okay. what happens when it's finally redeemed, I yeah. think this is uh, if you a go back and read this. This whole book is great, but pay so close attention to the 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 back and forth between the the angel and the the ghost here, because it's absolutely. I mean, for for the spiritual life, I think yeah. no better, uh, um, uh, no better advice can be given. You know, he says. Well, uh, what about the gradual process? That's way better than killing it. And he says the gradual process is of no use at all. You know, like just lends up, no use. And he mm. says he's like, well, you know, I, I'm not feeling very well. I'll go. Let me come back. I'll come back the first moment. I'll come back, you know, another day. And he says there are no other days. All days are present now. And he's like, well, <laughs> how about you know, how about a how about a different moment? And he says, this moment contains all moments, right. you know, and I think like that kind of advice for anybody in the, or, you know, any serious Catholic, mm -hmm. that's important. Like, you know, we don't put off the, the, the things of eternity till tomorrow you deal with them today. The gra you know, uh, there, there are no other days, you know, that's how we should, you know, really try to live our life that today is the only day we got, you know? This moment contains all moments. This, you know, sure. there are no other days. Now, now in, in heaven that'll be a reality. Um, but if we, but if we, if we live our life in that way, then we will always, I think, keep those, uh, those highest things uh, uh, correctly in the highest priority. Mm -hmm. um, right, right. So, so yeah. So the, so the angel kills this. Uh, uh, finally, finally kills it to the, uh, to the, to the suffering of the, uh, of the ghost. And the yeah. lizard is transformed into a brilliant stallion, right? You're right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great yeah. imagery. Great imagery. It is great. It is great. And 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 the same for him. I mean, he sort of like is kind of reborn into this kind of magnificent, um, you know, almost a demigod or something like that. Yeah. And and you know, um, there's a song here where it talks about um, the idea that there's a like almost all of heaven begins to sing, right? Like in a, like the land itself, right? Begins yeah, to sing. Yeah, yeah. As this transformation is taking place, and it talks about the master of our master, right? That that mm -hmm. these are actually, it's heaven singing about actually our natural affections and instincts. That our natural mm -hmm. affections and instincts need to be uh, purified so that we become their master. Yeah. So that we can then follow our master, right? Uh, Lord Jesus Christ. So if you think about it in those terms, right, what's happening here is he's actually getting mastery over, right, himself, over his natural instincts, over his desires, and becoming transformed, right? The, the way of heaven is the way of flourishing and transformation and new life, mm -hmm. still under God, right? That's important, right? Um, yeah. That we actually flourish when we're placed uh, under God, uh, I would just, uh, which is, I think, extremely hopeful, but also says a lot. And I think we can kind of just sort of summarize here uh, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the themes that we've talked about here. Um, it says a lot about what the way of heaven entails. It entails the idea of, importantly, the cross, right? But also total transformation and, and complete life and happiness as well. So I'll just read here. So this is, if you're, if you want to. Uh, find this. This is towards the very end of chapter 11. This is George MacDonald uh, addressing the narrator. He says, do you understand all this, my son, said the teacher. I don't know about all, sir, said I. Am I right in thinking that the lizard really turned into the horse? Aye, but it was killed first. You'll not forget that part of the story. I'll try not to, sir, but does it mean that everything, everything that is in us can go into the mountains? Mm -hmm. And this is George MacDonald's reply, and it's very important. Nothing, not even the best and noblest, can go as it is now. Notice that. Not even the best things, 
can go yeah. as they are now, right? Nothing, not even what is lowest and most bestial, will not be raised again if it submits to death. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Flesh and blood cannot come to the mountains, not because they are too rank, but because they are too weak. What is a lizard compared with a stallion? Lust is a poor, weak, whimpering, whispering thing, thing compared with that richness and energy of desire which will arise when all lust has been killed. So I mean, I think in some ways it's a just a like a kind of an inspiring vision of this is the way our lives are. Everything in us, right, can actually be transformed and elevated if it is first killed, right? That is, yeah. if we first let it uh, go through the cross, then it can be raised again, right, uh, to the new life uh, that's everlasting. Um, but it first has to be killed. <laughs> right? Yeah, it must uh, be every, buried. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, everything that's even noble in us. And then even the things then us that are base. Uh, so I want to encourage our listeners: uh, if you haven't read it, read C.S. Lewis's Great Divorce. And uh, in the meantime, check out all of our content at CatholicStudiesAcademy.com. And until next time, God bless. <laughs>